Hello and welcome to today's webinar, A Complete Guide to ROHS, The Fundamentals and Future. Now, is it Ross? Is it Rose? Is it Rojas? Whatever, we're talking about it today and it's very important. My name is Claire Forestier and I'm the host. I've brought, um, been brought in by HQTS who are sponsoring today's event. So HQTS have been providing quality assurance services around the world for more than 25 years. They're headquartered in Asia, but located in 16 other countries across the globe. And HQTS provides supply chain quality solutions for both commercial and consumer goods. Testing services, including ROS testing, that's what I'm going to call it, inspections, audits, and certification are among their services. They also take care of the production process management, production monitoring, training, and offer consulting, a lot of things. And their clients include companies in many verticals, including electronics, which is what we're all talking about today, obviously, but also agriculture, the automotive industry, construction, commodities, food, government, machinery, textiles, toys, you name it. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our speakers um, now. So the first speaker we're going to be hearing from is Stephen Andrews of Ascent, of Ascent Compliance, rather. Hi, Stephen. Hi there, everybody. So Stephen has been essentially a subject matter expert with Ascent for about a year and a half now, but he was previously the head of the UK's Environment Ministry's policy team, which had the responsibility for a wide range of environmentally focused product legislation, including the ROS Directive, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment, or WE Directive, and the Batteries Directive. And his team was also involved in the development of the Eco Design Regulations, as well as the promotion of the circular economy and all the initiatives looking to minimize the use of single use plastics. So great to have you with us, Stephen. Um, and our second speaker today is Malta Becker, who is the managing partner of the Brussels-based policy consultancy, IDUO. So um, Malta represents or supports different um, downstream clients with their environmental, chemical legislation and public affairs. And he has extensive experience in this field of environmental legislation, as well as in European affairs, in the cement industry and in the sector of household appliances. He's an expert member as well of the EU Commission Ad Hoc Working Group on Future Substance Restriction under the Ross Directive and a member of the German Chemical Society. So Morto, hello. Hello, hi. Great, so there's a lot to hear um, from you guys today and we're gonna hear from you each with a few presentations and some questions in between. Then we're gonna move on to a Q&A session with the audience. We've had some questions already, but we'd really love it if you guys use the Q&A function here on Zoom to ask your own questions. If you're not familiar with it yet, just click onto it, ask your question. And if someone's already asked a pretty similar one, then you can just upvote on that. Now we're gonna, we can go on until about um, 11, 15, depending where you are in the world, but till about quarter past the next hour. Um, and that's to make sure we get through all your questions. If we get through them sooner, then we will end sooner, but uh, between 11 and 11, 15 um, UK time. And obviously if you'd like a copy of the recording, please let us know in the chat, just put in your name, your company details, and of course your email, and then HQTS will send it on to you. So Stephen, you're up first. Your presentation is going to give us an overview of both the ROS Directive and the enforcement regime that lies behind. So um, Malta and I will turn off our cameras and microphones and leave you alone on the stage, so to speak. So take it away, Stephen. Fine, thank you very much, Claire. Thank you for that introduction and good day, everybody. Um, very sort of, I'm, I'm um, located in West London, a bit of a rainy morning this morning, a bit grey outside, but let's hope um, it clears up a bit later. Go for that. Thank you. As Claire has said, my name's Steve Andrews, and over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to give you an overview of the EC's ROHS, Restriction of Hazardous Substances Used in Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, uh, for brief, most people call it the Ross Directive, but uh, you do hear it called the Rojas Directive, the Roche Directive, or even the Rose Directive. Doesn't really matter what you call it. It's the ROHS Directive and applies to a list of hazardous substances used in electrical equipment. Next slide, please. But first of all, who is Ascent Compliance? 
Um, Ascent is a SaaS company, that's a software as a service company that offers supply chain data management solutions. As you can see from this slide here, we currently have a customer base of over 500 globally, working with over 75% of the Fortune 500 manufacturers. We have a supplier network database totaling now above 400,000 companies and a materials database with something like 250 million individual parts and components. The Ascent head office is in Ottawa in Canada and we have other offices in Columbus, Ohio and in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, plus um, support staff located in Malaysia and Kenya. Next slide. So, so this is a brief overview or the agenda for the content of the presentation I'd like to give. I'll start with a short background about the history so far of ROHS and why this piece of European legislation is always changing, never stays the same. And then we'll move on to the ways in which it's enforced with a couple of short case studies, the differences between ROS and the REACH regulation, and finally, a few words about the global ROS laws. Next slide, please. Thank you. So ROS, it has a really long history, but it's constantly changing. ROS 1, as it's now called, dates back to 2002 and came into force in mid-2006 on the 1st of July. It originally restricted the use of only six substances. These were the four heavy metals, lead, mercury, cadmium, and hexavalent chrome, plus two families of brominated flame retardants, the PBBs and the PBDEs. ROS1 was replaced by ROS2, or the ROS recast, uh, and that was agreed in 2011 and came into force at the beginning of 2013. It became a much more detailed directive, filling in a number of the gaps in the original version. Four new substances, all of them phthalates, and these were DEHP, BBP, DBP, and DIBP. They were added to the list of the original six substances in July last year. But for some sectors, medical devices and monitor control instruments doesn't apply till them until July uh, next year, July 2021. But the story continues. Establishing the need or otherwise for a ROS3 is un already underway and proposals are due from the European Commission in July next year. And then negotiations will begin in both the Council and the European Parliament. With that sort of timetable, we'd expect um, a, a date of around 2024 for the coming into force date for ROS3 if that happens. It can only be speculation at this stage, and Malta will be talking a bit about this later on, but the sort of things that ROS3 might address are the possibility of further additions to the list of restricted substances, the scope or coverage of the directive might be reviewed again, and the ways in which ROS relates to other legislation might be considered. Next slide, please. So ROS is a landscape of continuous change. I've just spoke about additional substances. There's already a parallel initiative underway to decide whether the list of now 10 should be extended further. A study to support that review was launched early in 2018 by the Commission, and it was undertaken by the German technical consultancy, the OCO Institute, and it originally sought information on seven specific extra substances. Following a series of public consultations that have been undertaken between April 2018 and February this year, a draft report was prepared by the OCO Institute in April. Initial indications are that only two of these substances, TBBPA and the medium chain chlorinated paraffins or MCCPSs for short, will be recommended for restriction but obviously we'll await the Commission and the response from the European Parliament and, and in due course the, the response from the Member States themselves before we know the final outcome. Next slide please. The list of the exemptions granted under ROS is also constantly changing. These allow for the use of the restricted substances above the standard maximum concentration values, which um, many of you will know is only 0.1% by weight in homogeneous materials. And these exemptions apply in specific and very technical applications. 
ROS2 introduced an automatic sunset date or expiry date for each of these exemptions. And the default is five years for most of the categories of products and equipment in the scope, but seven years for categories eight, which is medical device, and category nine, the monitoring and control instrument sector. Unless industry seeks and can justify an extension to these deadlines, the exemptions just disappear. <clears throat> Excuse me. ROS2, however, laid down the process for such requests for extensions. And an extension request has to be made at least 18 months before the deadline or the sunset date. And then at the end of the period of consideration, if it's decided to remove that exemption, industry has a period of a minimum of 12 and a maximum of 18 months um, so that it comply um, with the new requirements. This all sounded fairly straightforward, but unfortunately that's not been the case. When the first Ross Directive was published in 2002, there were only nine exemptions in an annex applying for, for the, the original six substances. By the time, still last slide please. When the, by the time that ROS2 came into effect, there was there were 77 exemptions applying to all categories and 24 applying only to medical devices and monitor control instruments. By April this year, the number had grown to over 300. So it's been a huge challenge to know which exemptions still apply, which exemptions have expired, and which exemptions have been amended. Plus, of course, there are new requests coming in from industry all the time. And, and again, Malta will be talking a lot more about this in his presentation. Next slide, please. So the next question is, are the regulations like Ross enforced by the European Commission and the, and the member states? The answer I'm afraid is a resounding yes. <clears throat> the evidence that you might be able to find easily, however, would suggest that this is not the case. The details of high profile enforcement activities are almost impossible to find. And the court cases are very few and far between. The enforcement of product legislation is a bit of a mystery to most of us, but the key point to bear in mind is that the enforcement authorities in the EU tend to work collaboratively with the manufacturers and the producers to avoid serious problems before they arise, meaning that most action is invisible outside of the parties involved. I would go further and actually say that the lack of published data and cases is an indication of how well the system is working. The member states do, however, have access to severe fines and can impose serious penalties. But in the vast majority of non-compliance issues, these sort of um, measures have not been needed. Next slide. And this sort of slide shows the sort of powers that are employed by the enforcement authorities. And they're listed in a scale from the light touch to the more serious and damaging. At one end, you have a simple warning letter, wet warning letter that might be enough in most cases. At the other end, you have product withdrawal, fines for non-compliance. And remember that these fines are multiplied by the number of units that a particular product has been placed on the market. So if you're found to be non-compliant with one unit of your product and, um, and you're um, say, let's find 5,000 euros, you have to multiply that by the number of units that went out in that batch. So if it was a thousand units, that's 5,000 pounds times a thousand, which is obviously um, quite a serious amount of money. And perhaps most damaging and worrying for companies is the bottom one, is the adverse publicity, which means it's damaging to both their reputation and their standing within the sector. Next slide, please. I said I'd mention a couple of case studies very quickly, and I've anonymized these, obviously, to, to protect the names of the companies concerned. At one extreme, I remember a case when I was still working for government, um, and under Article 7 of ROS2, um, companies should let um, enforcement authorities know if they become aware of a non-compliance issue with one of their products. So in this case, a major IT manufacturer who, who um, places laptops on the market, very, very um, high profile, well-known name, discovered that one of the components on its printed circuit boards in one model of its laptops was non-compliant. So they followed the instructions under Article 7 of ROS2 and contacted a, um, one of the 
enforcement authorities in the European Union and told them about this minor infringement that had arisen from a change of supplier that, had, uh, that, that um, gave them that particular component. And uh, they became aware of it and immediately let um, the enforcement authority know. So in this case, the enforcement authority and the company agreed a six month improvement plan to get that um, um, non-compliant component out of the supply chain and replace it with a compliant one. So after the six month improvement plan was agreed, no further action was taken and it was all forgotten about. At the other extreme, however, and this particular um, case that I'm gonna to refer to dates back to the marketing and use directive that preceded Ross in controlling hazardous substances in products. Here, a consignment of games consoles was being imported into the EU and the authorities at the borders found them to have over 20 times the amount of per permitted cadmium in the, the leads and cables. This equipment that was being imported was valued at over 180 million euros and it was seized at the port of entry, leaving the company concerned with a significant loss of sales and perhaps more significantly, significantly a loss of reputation. So you can see how it can vary from one extreme to the other. But as I said before, um, most cases are at the lower extreme and are sorted out by a simple exchange of correspondence or a, um, a tech check on the technical files to ensure that the company concerned has undertaken its due diligence. Next slide, please. And I'm afraid the latest news for companies is that the levels of enforcement activity that will be undertaken by the EU member states will be rising significantly over the coming years. Agreed in June um, 2019, last year, this new regulation from the European Commission is on market surveillance and it will bring the enforcement efforts related to over 70 separate laws together and though that they're listed in the annex to the regulation and they include both the ROS directive and other similar directives like the batteries directive and the REACH regulation. This regulation places obligations on the member state governments to both prepare robust national market surveillance strategies that in turn will be approved by the Commission and have to be updated at least every four years. And it will also oblige them to join a union product compliance network to ensure top level cooperation right across Europe. These national strategies will promote a consistent, comprehensive and integrated approach to market surveillance and enforcement, something that was seen to be lacking beforehand. The regulation also outlines several new powers for the market surveillance authorities. These include unannounced site inspections for facilities manufacturing their product within the European Union, border checks for those products coming from outside the Union, and the ability to enforce product recalls much more easily. It also gives member state authorities the power to recover the full costs of their enforcement activities in relation to any particular investigation. So it's not just a fixed and capped fine under local legislation. So it's bad news here for those that are flouting or ignoring the rules, but maybe good news for those companies that abide by those rules at, at significant additional production and research and development costs, and it will help them seek the so-called level playing field. Next slide, please. So enforcement is expected to increase. Article 23 of the Ross Directive, Ross 2, <clears throat> already says that the penalties for non-compliance should be both effective and dissuasive. So this new regulation will underline that message and it will bring forward a much more joined up and effective landscape of product law enforcement in all 27 member states across the European Union. Next slide, please. So let's to, to move on to a different subject. Since REACH has been enforced, many have questioned why ROS is still relevant. And I've often said in presentations before that if I had a pound or a euro for every time someone asked me that question, I probably wouldn't need to work now and be talking to you from my villa in the south of France, but I'm not. <laughs> so the European Commission has always been very clear that these laws are of equal standing and of, are of equal importance. REACH, the, re the Registration, Evaluation, Assessment, and authorization of chemicals is a horizontal framework of rules. 
it applies right across the use of chemicals and substances in products and equipment, whether they're manufactured within the European Union or imported into it. REACH has a watch list of what are known as substances of very high concern, SVHCs. It also has annexes of both restricted substances and those that are subject to outright bans. The Ross Directive, on the other hand, is a vertical piece of legislation and its approach to substance control applies only to electrical and electronic equipment, although that's obviously a very broad scope. It has a much smaller list of restricted substances, as we've already seen, only 10 at the moment, but these are effective bans outside the use of those substances in very small quantity allowed by the specific exemptions that I spoke about earlier. So Ross and Reach, very different animals, both um, controlling the amount of substances but in, that are used, but also in very different ways. Next slide. So my final slide for the morning or, or the afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, is how is the EC or European ROS connected to the other ROS legislation now found in other parts of, of the world, such as China, Korea, Mexico, the UAE, and now Russian ROS? EC ROS was the first type of this legislation to be established, and it's led to this wide range of copycat law. I've often referred to them as the ROS babies around the world, with, with Ross, EU ROS being the father of them. The important points to bear in mind here is that firstly, they apply to products placed on the market in those geographic regions only. They do not apply to the place of manufacture or assembly. So if you have to comply with China ROS, it's because you're placing product on the market in China. If you're applying, uh, complying with EC ROS, it's because you're placing product on the market in the European Union and so on. Secondly, they all control so far the same list of substances. No one's gone away from the original six that some still maintain or the new list of the enhanced 10 of, of 10 with the four phthalates. But you need to be aware that other things may differ in the detail. Some of the overall scope in these pieces of ROS legislation differ from the European ROS. Sometimes products are excluded that are not excluded in Europe or the other way around. And, some, and the exemptions certainly are very, very different. And some exemptions are in place in some, some of the geographic regions that are not in place in Europe. So you have to be very careful when you look at these pieces of Rogers legislation, depending on where you're placing product on the market, because they can vary. Next slide. So that's it. That's part, my part of the, present, um, of the morning. So many thanks for your time and attention. And I'll pass the microphone back to Claire now um, and look forward to hearing about your thoughts and questions. Thank you very much, um, Stephen. So I actually have a question or two for you now. In fact, and I'm going to bring um, Malta back on the stage as well. Although I know we're meant to be calling you Malta. I don't, we just can't pronounce your name. We're rubbish. I'm so sorry, Malta. So <laughs> please come back it's in. Okay. <laughs> you know what it is? You can tell us a million times, but we'll still say it wrong. I'm so sorry about that. So, so let's, so, okay. What's this revised, what's going to look like taking into account reach um, can you give us a clue? What do you think it's going to look like, Stephen? And then I'll yeah, um... sorry, yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, and apologies, Malta. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, well, the answer is we don't know, of course, because um, you know none of us have crystal balls, and if we did, we'd be um, be, be be running very oh, very um, lucrative mm -hmm. companies and in the compliance area. Um, but we do know, obviously, the Commission um, looked at Ross before. Um, it looked at what, what things had worked very well and it looked at what things had um, worked not so well and tried to address those in, in what became ROS 2 in 2011, the ROS recast. And, you know, ROS 1 was a very, very simple piece of legislation of about four pages long. ROS, 3, uh, ROS 2 became, I think, something like 25 pages long. Um, so when you look for, for ROS 3, you, you think the whole process will go again. Uh, the Commission will be looking at what are the latest substances of concern that apply to electrical and electronic equipment and maybe putting more in the list of substances. It'll be looking at the ways it's enforced and it'll be looking more importantly, um, certainly in line with the Green Deal and the chemical strategies which have been published over the last few months. How, did, how does ROS and how does REACH um, interact with each other and how can they both work together rather than conflicting, because as I said in the slide near the end of my presentation, there has been this confusion. So we expect to see more of the same, 
more detail and hopefully more clarification. Okay, so that's the, that's the dream is some clarity around this. Okay, what about you? Um, do you have, uh, uh, Malta, do you have like a kind of <laughs> what you'd like it to look like maybe? What would you hope for? Well, I think um, in the moment I would not have to add really something to uh, what Steve was saying. I do have in my last slides in my part of the presentation some indications may how it may look like. And probably we can start from there afterwards if there are some follow up questions and we can go into more detail. Okay, great, great. So a um, bit of a taster there of what we're going to be getting from you. Thank you very much. Well, what we'll do now is Stephen and I will disappear from the screen and uh, leave you to it, if that's okay. We'll Absolutely. see you shortly. Thank you. Okay, take it away. Everybody. This is still the speaker clear indicating here. Oh yeah, you've got the wrong speakers up. Well, I'm sure we'll get the wrong speakers, wrong panel, yep. wrong slides even up. We'll get there. They're on it now. Here you go. Absolutely. Okay, um, let's start. Let's go to the, the, the title, please, first. One slide up, please. Just, I think, yeah, just maybe give it a go anyway, and, and we'll sort the slides out behind you. Okay, now then, uh, please, can we go to the agenda first? So we do it like that. Thank okay, you. good. My part of the presentation will be a bit more practical down to earth in terms of what is really something a uh, manufacturer has to consider when we are talking about uh, compliance with uh, the ROST requirements uh, in terms of assessment and also proof of this compliance. And uh, this will be the main part, which you see on the agenda number three. The first two points are going to more some kind of supplementary details to what uh, Steve was already saying. And number four is uh, the outlook I was indicating in the answer before. Okay, let's start with the next slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, the open scope was already indicated, uh, indicated by Steve in terms of a major change in from ROS1 to ROS2. Uh, there is one thing I would like to highlight here. This is sometimes a misunderstanding which uh, needs some kind of clarification. Um, ROS in principle, if you read the title and the scope is only talking about electric and electronic equipment, EEE. So manufacturers, producers could be of the mistaken idea that they don't have to care about it and they just produce. Um, and this is certainly incorrect for the cases where uh, you have contracts with your customers and you know that uh, you have to fulfill ROS compliance uh, due to the performance requirements you have signed. So for the sake of, of clarity and uh, uh, future let's say, uh, continuity. I would also uh, strictly, clearly say that uh, also components have to be compliant, otherwise the final assembled uh, product cannot be some, uh, compliant never. Okay, number two, next slide, please. Here, I just want to highlight uh, some supplementary remark regarding the exemption process. I think um, it is important to mention that the continuous need for industry to justify continued uh, exemption requests is putting a continuous pressure on industry to improve, to find and to search for alternatives. And uh, next slide, please. This has one consequence for the wording of the actual exemptions, which are 
being granted uh, continuously by the Commission, the growing will be much more granular, much more detailed, which means coming from a generic e exemption of, let's say, lead in, in a certain alloy, you will have then at some point in time 10 part of exemptions which are talking about very specific applications in which the uh, lead would only be allowed, but in others it would not be allowed anymore. So uh, this is something which should be borne in mind also in terms of monitoring the legal developments of ROS, because uh, this landscape is changing and significantly changing. Actually. Okay, we come now to the more practical part uh, down to earth on how to deal with assessment and uh, proof of compliance. One essential element of, uh, of the new ROS2 was that it is a CE mark uh, regulation, or directive, better say, I'm sorry. And this means internal production control as well as due diligence are uh, key cornerstones of, of the systems. And once a manufacturer of a EE has placed the CE mark on his product, the presumption of uh, uh, conformity applies. And hence, uh, it is an indication to authorities, yes, here would I declare this is compliant. Um, however, how to prove it for, for documentation and for uh, cases which were described by Steve, if there are some, some discussions with the authorities. So Article 7 is clearly describing that you have to set up a technical documentation. And uh, this should be in line with the so-called Module A. Um, in essence, this means you have two choices. You can have, you can apply a standard and uh, follow the standard with all the requirements and finally come to the conclusion, yes, I can prove it, my part is compliant. Or you can have, uh, can try to, to establish a similar system, but you have proof and you have to prove that it is working in the same way as the standard would be. Um, we go to the next slide, please. So in essence, there is what you have to do as a, as a manufacturer of EE and a component of EE, you have to determine what kind of information do you need from your suppliers, from your components. You have to collect them and you have to evaluate uh, this information about quality of uh, liability and whether it should, for instance, uh, turn into a technical documentation uh, can be kept otherwise. And you have to periodically review these data to ensure consistency and also uh, continuous production control quality. Okay, so what does it mean in, in really down to earth questions? We have two questions to, to answer ourselves in this case. This is the first question is, and they are based on the standard requirements. Um, the question number one is what is the potential of a component to be uh, to contain restricted substances uh, and the second question is really related not to component but to a supplier what is the reliability or trustworthiness of a supplier and uh, which is providing you materials components or sub-assemblies uh, which are supposed to be in accordance with the ROS2 requirements. Okay, try to answer now the question one on the component. Here, before I'm going into more detail, I have to say that, um, please bear in mind the examples I'm bringing up now, they are coming from my experience. Um, it is certainly up to each company to look in house, what kind of parameters do I collect what kind of parameters can be used to make these kind of assessments and um, hence come probably to different conclusions. But um, the examples I'm bringing here are giving, I think, quite a good in indication in which directions one can think about. Um, so when we talk about a component, uh, we, are talk, we, we can talk about the individual component or we talk about the final product which is containing a component. Uh, in terms of individual component, you have some kind of intrinsic risk because of a complexity of a component. The more complex, apparently, 
the more is the likelihood that probably something goes wrong in terms of in compliance, or you have uh, critical materials which are known to contain in the past or sometimes still contain uh, these banned substances uh, in your component. So this is certainly something which is most common and most important. Uh, in, in addition to that, um, you have your own testing experience probably of specific components and you know therefore component A appears to be more critical than component B. And uh, you may have also some indications from authorities and surveillance programs which are helping you here to make further assessments. In terms of the final product, I think um, here my ideas uh, are more related to in the cases where a incompliance had been detected by you, by your uh, customer or by uh, surveillance authorities, it doesn't matter at the end. Here indication of the criticality would be how long did it take to bring a certain component into conformity? Uh, were there cases of withdrawal or even recall, which would cost a lot of money? So all these picture together would uh, can be completed and uh, evaluated. In terms of supplier risk, this is really something distinct, different, and um, it's, it may appear difficult to distinct in practice, but uh, I hope with these examples, I can help a bit to do so. So you may have uh, to consider, as first point I'm mentioning here, what is the crit criticality of your uh, component um, for the EE assembly of and, and your production. You have alternative suppliers who are providing this, uh, or is it the only one supplier you have for, for some specific reasons? So this would be one thing to consider. The reliability of the supplier, there you could use generic quality assurance track records, which do not necessarily have something to do with uh, ROS compliance. Um, but uh, you could also, in case of uh, detected incompliance, consider how much, how agile a supplier was in terms of correcting and finding solutions for non-compliance. Um, and you may have in your quality assurance systems parameters which are verifying uh, these kind of things. Uh, it could also be a important factor to, to think what kind of environmental management system does a uh, supplier has? Is it, is it fit for purpose to incorporate uh, ROS requirements and, and, and procedures to follow? And um, yeah, audit results may also be a good, good possibility to make this kind of assessment. If you combine all this information then together in the next slide, you will um, first looking at the right uh, table you can see here, you may be able to, uh, to summer or to, to, to condense these parameters to um, uh, parameters stemming from the supplier in investigation and the component investigation. You, you will be able to weigh them in terms of in relative relevance uh, for the whole compliance. And uh, when you do the math and uh, bring these things together, you will come to the matrix you can see on the left side. This matrix is combining the risks from the component and the suppliers. And in this example, I think this is also rather practical. I don't think that you will go for a four by four matrix at this point in time. Um, you appear, there appear four distinct, let's say areas. And these areas would mean uh, you will have to make your assessment what kind of information you ask from your suppliers in order to be to accommodate the risk and to be sure that uh, uh, you did your utmost to uh, to achieve and to get supplied compliant uh, components and products. The next slide is giving an indication how this could look like. Let's say the lowest level, uh, which were indicated with uh, an uh, in the green uh, color in the matrix could be called free, free clearance of components, which means you have a high reliable supplier, you have a relative low risk component, which means it could be sufficient to have a supplier declaration, which is uh, and, and you'll renewed and then you would be on the fine side. 
in the worst case, um, you might require external test reports, we, even with annual renewal and uh, additional information requirements on specific cases which you had, this, uh, had figured out. So this is really something you will have to make up and to define clearly what kind of information do I need and do uh, fulfill the requirements of the respective standards in order to approve gross compliance. Okay, if you have all done that, the final result will be seen in the next slide. Um, this means this matrix or this, this table could condense all the information you will have to provide at the end of the day. So we are talking here about the bill of material, which is uh, describing the individual components of the, uh, of the part or of the uh, equipment we are talking about. Um, we will have to know, this is essential in, in, in order for, for testing, whether an exemption applies on, on certain substances or not. And um, in terms of required documentation, you will see here that um, also different levels uh, will apply and will have to be uh, managed and, and uh, filled in uh, depending on uh, the component and the supplier. So at the end of the day, um, the example here is suboptimal because you have still one, one red field left. No, sorry, we are not yet, yet there. Um, so I, at the end of the day, your status should all show green colors and then you are ready to have uh, your uh, final technical documentation done. But this is not, not sufficient. You will have to uh, apply the CE marking on the final products, which I indicated would then show to the rest, to the outside world that you are applying presumption of conformity. And this technical documentation will have to be reviewed and you have to store all this information, including the declaration of conformity uh, for a period of 10 years time. And in, in addition to that, you have to register non-conforming activities and actions you did and so on and so forth. I'm stopping here now for a while um, and we are making a little yeah, excursion into a future outlook to see what could happen in the future and what we will have to monitor um, later on for the so-called was three as Steve called it. Um, in terms of exemptions, um, here it is good to know that in this year, many, many, many exemptions were requested for renewal. The studies are delayed, uh, but I think in 2021, we will have a more clear picture what of exemptions will be renewed and in how the wording, exact wording in terms of granularity, as I indicated before, will look like. For all of you who are not producing the standard categories which had been in ROS already from the beginning, so in particular category 11 for all new, um, or all, all products which are not in the list of category one to 10. Um, in this case, uh, it is good to know that uh, based on, on a Japanese associations uh, drive, um, there was also an attempt now to align with the exemption requests and um, they will now also uh, go for a requirement renewal round uh, in this year. Okay, next slide. This is leading us to the outlook of, of Ross itself. As Steve indicated, we are talking here uh, about um, already a process running since 2018 in terms of further restrictions. Uh, he indicated already the two substances, MCCP and TBPPA, which are relatively likely to be included in the annex for restrictions. Uh, and they came from the list uh, you can see below. Um, and all these other five substances were deemed not relevant or not applicable uh, by the consultants. Uh, if you would like to have a flavor, how many other substances in this Ross review may be enter a potential uh, restriction. Um, I'm referring to this and the next slide. We don't have to go in detail, but they are priority one substances for future evaluations. 
determined by the consultants so far. We can skip the next slide. And now I am uh, coming to the second point, the big legislative review of ROS, which is legally required by, uh, by being started, starting uh, in the next year. Um, I think the big battlefields to get in more detail, a bit more detail than, than Steve was uh, giving in his answer to his question. Um, I think one big discussion will be, shall Ross stay a directive or shall it become a regulation, which will have um, quite some implication in terms of implementation or, or enforcement in the different member states. There will be some questions about the internal coherence between uh, Article 5 and Article 6 on exemptions and restrictions. Just to give you an idea, the NGOs in earlier times always argued, oh, we can, we can ban essentially everything because uh, you can still ask for ex uh, still exemptions, which would uh, render the ban completely useless. But uh, if you have a special process to ask for and to, to decide on restrictions, I think you must, must distinct very clearly how these processes shall look like. In terms of future restrictions, uh, I think the, there is some tendencies, a big pressure, political pressure, to um, bring the precautionary principle more in the forefront and to, to go less uh, relevant, uh, to take risk assessment, including the exposure, uh, a bit more on the important side. Uh, one substance, one assessment is discussed in this context, which means, uh, do I have to assess the risk or the, the, the hazard uh, by, by various um, legislations in parallel, like, like REACH and ROS, or do I have one shop stop who is doing that? In terms of exemptions, I think here there was a general uh, request from industry to improve the efficiency of the process because uh, uh, due to the high amount, high increase of activities, um, which were indicated by the figures uh, from, from Steve, um, the commission is not really able to work in time, in the time which is required by law to answer to requests. And um, it's also certainly trying, or we can see that there will be potential to reduce administrative burden in this process too. Okay, having said that, we are coming back to the compliance proof and assessment. What do you have now essentially to do in, in a recap with the next two slides? So you have to know your ROS requirements and to continue the development, to, to monitor the developments uh, which are continuing and which are relevant to take into consideration when you are producing EEE. You have to know your portfolio and uh, to manage your critical components and to uh, make, as I have explained, the component risk supplier, uh, supplier risk assessment. You will have to do some potential in-house testing or uh, external testing uh, from, from the components and final products. This would uh, be linked to first-time approval of new components, but even as important, continued production uh, control testing is as well important um, in this case. In the next slide, in addition to the portfolio and the assessment, the next slide, please. Here we are. Uh, you have to have a quality insurance system in place, which is ideally linked to your general management and environmental system, which you will have to audit. And in order to ensure that you are up to date and the processes are really doing what they are supposed to do at the end of the day. And you will have to have an IT system in place, which is uh, generating the technical documentation, which is regularly review, uh, asking for regular review with the information demands to your suppliers or yourself in terms of updating information. And you have the system is also should also be in the position to store this kind of information. If you take all these demands now together, I think there are certainly companies who can do all that on their own. But only taking the example of testing, it is very, very likely that you and uh, in your companies will, will, will have to rely on um, third party help, be it labs who make the tests or be it even 
other um, third party institutions who are going further and helping you a bit in the example, as you can see here in the circle, with a full fledged um, support in terms of your complete gross compliance. And with that, I would like to close. Looking forward to the questions and um, thank you very much. Hi, thanks so much, um, Malta. Thank you. And, you know, actually, there you go. I was just about to say that HQTS put it up there. But, um, you know, you've just been talking about third party quality assurance providers. And obviously, HQTS, who is our sponsor today, um, does exactly that. So I might just ask you quickly a question before we go to um, the audience. How can, you know, what, what's the real benefit or how can a quality assurance partner really wrangle this ROS issue? What's the best thing they do or the, the key thing people, why sh people should be using them, do you think? And I'll come well, to I you think, with that first, Stephen, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think certainly uh, testing of appliances and components will be one, one of the critical issues where they can support. But uh, going beyond that, I think to audit your processes, to ensure that your processes are up to speed and really doing what they are supposed to do to, to really show ROS compliance at the end of the day, here, a third party, a third external view might be helpful that you are not, or shall I say, cooking on your own juices some, at some point in time. And um, yeah, generally in terms of management, I think it's also important that uh, you, you have to have a management system which is working and uh, is doing what it's supposed to do. I like that. Cooking on your own juices. That's great. What about this you, Stephen? coming from German. I don't know how to translate it into English properly. No, it's great. How do you say it in German? Im eigenen Saft kochen. Brilliant. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Marinating, stewing. We just say stewing in your own juice. is a different expression, isn't it? Um, Steve, yeah. what about you? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to answer in German because I did German <laughs> exams when I was about 16 year, years old, which was a long time ago and forgotten most of it. O levels, <laughs> German O levels. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, the old before GCSEs. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are, I mean, one of the points uh, to help companies, of course, is keeping in touch with their supply chain and communicating with them and, and, and keeping on in touch with what developments are happening. And as you saw from my presentation and from Malta's, the um, that the legislation is always changing, that the goalposts are always moving to use the sports analogy. So it's very, very difficult. Um, some people have regulatory compliance experts within their own companies, others buy them in, but you know, um, the, the communication's the key. Keep, keep in touch, let your suppliers know what you need and why you need it. And that, that whether that's done through a third party or from within the company, that, that's the key. To, to keeping on top of all this. And, and the point to bear in mind is the, the principle of due diligence, which means that if you are challenged by an enforcement authority, you have to show that you would have done as much as any reasonable company could have expected to have done to, to comply. There you go, brilliant. I was just about to ask you for that, Fung. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. you know, you need uh, to get the experts in. Because I think it is really, really important uh, to stress the, the communication with the supplier, I think this is something which is really, really crucial. And here, you, the, your system should be able to regularly inform your suppliers about new requirements from your site, updating things and so on, and, and also getting the feedback from the suppliers in terms of information you require. This is absolutely essential, yes. Brilliant. Well, there you go, everybody. There's the, there's the um, what you can get from HQTS. And obviously, if you want to know anything else about them, go on to hqts.com or send an email 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 to them at inquiry at hqts.com. And also, please, if you want a copy of the recording of today's um, web, webinar, please just put your details, your company name and your email in the chat and we'll make sure that you get that. So now the fun bit, let's have a look at what the audience have been asking you. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. So the first question that I've seen here is, when do we need to have tested according to Ross 3? Like, uh, that's from EHE, whoever that is. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for sending in your question. Who wants to take that first? Malta? Malta? I, I can. The answer is very simple and short. There is no ROS 3 yet, so there is no need to consider <laughs> that. We have oh, in the moment ROS 2. We have applicable bands in Annex 3. That's what you have to comply with. Yes. <laughs> so this yeah. is, in that sense, it's a good news. You don't have ROS okay. 3 yet. Don't worry about ROS 3 yet. Just worry about ROS yes. 2. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll... 
I'll echo what uh, Malta said there. Um, yeah, it's a common misconception. Lots of people refer to the addition of the four phthalates, which was done by what we call a delegating directive to ROS. But lots of people call that ROS3, but quite, Malta's quite right. ROS3 is the proposals that we're expecting next year and probably will not come into force for another three or four years. Um, but as far as testing is concerned, remember ROS is what we call a self-declaration piece of legislation. So effectively, by putting your product on the market and placing the CE mark on that product to show it's um, compliant with the relevant legislation, including ROS, you're saying my product is OK. And there is no need for testing unless, I mean, the, the main, mainly testing is needed when you have concerns or worries that a particular component might not be compliant. And in that case, we would advise people to, to, to have testing done. But the way in which ROS works is you don't have to have testing documentation for the whole product, but you do <clears throat> have to have technical documentation that um, supports your assumption that your supply chain is clean of the um, restricted substances. Okay, thank you. Now I think that would have clarified that question for them really yeah, well. I yeah, would sorry. like to, the, this is probably the message is a bit too easy for me here mm -hmm. because um, when you look at the matrix I, I have shown, if you have these cases where you had this red area, you will certainly not be able to avoid testing. Otherwise, you, you have no idea whether you are in, in the green zone or not. Okay. I think yeah. you have to I make, and that's important, your risk assessment. And then you may there may be cases where you don't need to test, but to rule it out in principle would not be sufficient. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I would echo echo that. Yeah, it's, as I said, it's you took the words out of my mouth. Risk assessment is the um, the key to all this. If you have components that could possibly contain some of the substances, then testing, and you don't have sufficient documentation, or you're not um, confident enough that information is robust, then testing is okay. But um, you know, for things like you know, you you know, some of the components will not contain one of the ten substances, um, so it's hugely un. You know, there's no need to test those components. OK, so if you're doing your risk assessments as you should be, it will be obvious when you need to test and when you don't need to test. Brilliant. OK, so the next we had a question about the um, pop regulation, which obviously is the production and use of persistent organic pollutants that the EU um, has in place. Do you have any information about that? Can you sort of talk about that? How uh, the question was, how about the pop regulation? <laughs> I'll take it first, if you like. Um, the POPs regulation, as you quite rightly say, persistent organic pollutants, is, is a regulation that the EU has put in place because of a European, uh, sorry, a global um, obligation placed on it by the United Nations, comes from the um, Stockholm Convention. And the POPs regulation is, is there for um, specific substances which are known to be toxic and heart damaging to the environment in, you know, and, bioaccumulative and all sorts of things. There are about 30 substances, I think, on the latest POPs list. It's also it's um, enforced by the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki. If people want to know more information about it, I would advise them to go and look at that website. We, the European Chemicals Agency is ECHA, E-C-H-A. So if you Google that, look at their website, and there is a whole section on POPs, and it will also give you the latest um, guidance and also the um, the list of substances that are controlled under POPs. Now there is sometimes an overlap between things like POPs and REACH. In fact, we've had one very recently uh, uh, regarding PFAS. And um, where that happens, the rule is that the most stringent piece of legislation applies. So PFAS is actually being taken out of the REACH list and put into, because it's in the POPs list. That's happened um, earlier this year. Okay, all right. Um, and the other question I've got here is with the current ROS, are we getting new exemptions for the materials that used to be exemption free? And how do we handle this? New exemptions? I think you always have the possibility to ask for an exemption at the Commission. So uh, if you find out that uh, at some point in time uh, you need a substance, you can always ask for it and it will be evaluated. In addition to, add, uh, to this, as I indicated, this increased granularity with each re renewal request will to a certain extent also lead to new exemptions because th the wording of the old exemption will look like in five years time differently. So you have to always watch out what is still now 
allowed and exempted and what is not exempted anymore. Okay. So these two aspects probably would relate to it. Does it take ages to get that information back when you when you put in a, a request for an exemption? How long does that kind of thing take? There is a very distinct process, even in, in the ROS directive, how long it has to take. If you file uh, your complaint, uh, your, your request, the commission has 18 months to work on it, and then it, it goes along and along. So um, in, in practice, it, it takes longer in the moment, but in principle, the process is very clear, and you will get information well, I think after 18 months after your, your uh, request. Yeah, and the other thing to bear in mind is that these, as I said in my presentation, these exemptions are really, really specific now. In, in, in Ross 1, they were quite broad, like um, the lead in the glass of old cathode ray televisions, which was huge. Um, now they talk about, you know, the minute pieces of lead used in a solder in a flip chip. Uh, and, you know, some of, some of the exemptions, if you look at them, you know, they're longer almost than the Ross Directive because they're so technical and they only apply in that tiny, tiny instance. And technology moves on, so that's why there's always a need for requests for new exemptions. And when an exemption, somebody's just asked here, but it was actually on top of my time, when an exemption is extended, how long is that extended for? That was David well, Mann. There are also the lawyers helping us. The maximum expiry date is five years. Right. So um, unless the commission, uh, the consultants is recommending to use a, a, a shorter term because availability uh, substitutes are likely to be available earlier than that, then it will be less than five years, but in principle five years. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, that, that, that's true. I think I've, that's one of my slides that covered that. But um, the principle again is you can only use that substance above the restricted level, maximum concentration levels, if there is no substitute available, or that substitute is more detrimental to the environment than the original substance, or it's commercially just not viable. So, you, you know, there is quite a stringent test to get an exemption. It's not just, I'd like an exemption. And that's why it takes so long to check and um, confirm. Good, because it did seem long to me as well. I mean, I, I don't work in this field, so I wouldn't know, but it's 18 months seems a long time for anything. Um, it's a question here, which I don't quite understand, but you guys might. Is How is the mini with we directive? It might be a typo. Does that make sense to you? Not yet. I just look at... <laughs> It could be a typo. Maybe they'll go into more detail on that one. We've got another. Yeah, all, all, all I would say on that one is just, just as a quick um, overview is remember the WEA directive is the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, as you know you said in my introduction, <clears throat> and they they are actually sister directives, and they were both originally brought in to control the amount of hazardous substances or restrict the amount of hazardous substances that are going into landfill sites to cause problems at end of life once the equipment is discarded. Yeah. So the Ross Directive did that by taking the substance out of the original product and the WE Directive controls the end of life recycling. So they, they, they fit together and they originally were actually one of part of one proposal broken up. Um, this is back in the God, late 1990s. I've been working on this too long. <laughs> you have, yeah, they work, yeah, they work together, uh, but they are separate pieces of legislation and WE's mainly to do with taking responsibility for the recycling costs. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that answered that question for them. So um, another question we've got here is, and I also wanted to just say, because someone's noticed something here, which I love, which is, she said, this is a little bit over my head. I may need to contact via email for some clarification. Absolutely do that, Emma, and anybody else who's gone, whoosh, um, because obviously, you know, it's hard with all of these things to balance the level at which you guys talk. Do we go very in the weeds or do we go very high level? So if anything has been confusing, please do ask for clarification. They're all experts here and, and they can talk on every level that you need. So, so do get in touch. Um, next question was, what is the line between a component and a product in line with the need to mark them with CE? Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry. Yeah, what's the line between a component and a product in line with the need to marking them with the CE certif certification. Well, a, a component cannot be marked CE. It's really specifically, Ross is referring to final products. Right. But if you are a supplier of a component, which is assembled into a EEE, -E, then by definition, it has to be Ross compliant too. Does this answer the question? Yeah, but it doesn't need to be marked as you quite rightly say. Yeah, it cannot it's, be. The it's, it's the final piece of product or equipment or kit that's placed that on the market, like the laptop. 
it has to be yeah. CE marked. It's not every little bit of the laptop. Otherwise, you know, you'd have, got, I don't know, 10,000 <laughs> CE marks in a laptop. <laughs> Wouldn't quite work. No, fair enough. That, I hope that clarifies that for you. Um, who asked that question? M M Maya asked that question. So I hope that works for you. And then the next one is, as a manufacturer of raw materials for E&E &E products, is there any requirement to extend ROS test results of the raw materials to our clients, i.e. the manufacturer of the E&E &E products? Oh, no, that's from the manufacturer, sorry. I'm thinking. If well, I would you think, are supplying yeah. a raw material to your customer who is further processing is it, let's say he's taking uh, metal sheets and then taking something out of it. Well, yes. in that case, surely the metal sheet has to comply with the ROS requirements. Yes, this as you can see, yeah, from the very beginning, yeah. from the beginning, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, if I, you know, I would say, remember on ROS, it's the final product. So it means the final pro product producer or manufacturer is responsible for the compliance of the whole product. And to do that, he is heavily reliant on his supply chain. So the supply chain has an obligation to inform their clients, wherever they are, could be tier seven, tier five, above, that whatever, if they know that something's being put into electrical and electronic equipment that has to comply with the ROS directive, then they have to tell them whether that part of the supply chain is, is compliant or not. Yeah. So that's how it works. It cascades upwards to the ultimate uh, producer. But the ultimate producer is the person who's going to get into trouble. Um, if they don't. So yeah, it's that, that's that line. Okay, well, look, you know, we can see there was sort of huge variety of, of knowledge and, and where, you know, levels that people are coming from. So as I said, please do um, get in touch with HQTS or with any of the speakers today, if you've got any questions. And I think that's pretty much it for now. I wanted to just give you guys one last chance. What do you think should be the key thing people take away from today or the key thing you've taken away maybe from today? If I come to you first, Malta. Prepare your risk assessment. Do everything in place What, in terms of parameters, details needed to ensure that you have at the end of the day, a proper declaration of conformity at hand. Good one. Get your, get your risk assessments in order, everybody. Okay, Stephen, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I would fully agree with that. I mean, it goes back to the point I made earlier, communication. You need, you need to understand what, what, what you need to do and why you need to do it. And more importantly, your supply chain needs to understand why you might be asking for information about particular components or, or sub-assemblies. And, and the trick is, I mean, the, the, the trap, sorry, rather than the trick that a lot of people fall into is that, yes, I know all about Ross. Um, yeah, it's been around since 2006. Done that, been there, got the T-shirt, as they say. Actually not, because as you know, as my pre first part of my presentation hopefully demonstrated, this is a piece of legislation that's always changing. It's mm. constantly evolving. So you've, you've got to keep your eyes on it to keep to know what the latest requirements are. That's great. Well, that's really good advice, guys. So, you know, keep on top of the changing legislation, keep on top of your risk assessments and communicate really well with your entire supply chain. Um, great advice. Um, I've learned loads today um, and I'm not even in this field. So <laughs> that's good. Really interesting presentations. Thank you very much. And to anybody still listening, you know, please get in touch with HQTS if you've got any questions. If you want a copy of the um, webinar, hopefully you've put that in the chat. And thank you so much to HQTS for sponsoring today's event. And we will be doing more soon. So um, watch your emails and uh, social media to find out when that's going to be happening. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of the day, wherever in the world you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for hosting. Thanks.